Hi everyone and welcome to the Coronavirus and Capitalism video series. I'm going to try to teach you some of the basic principles of economics with a special focus on the United States' system of capitalism by making connections with the current coronavirus pandemic. This is my first time making a video like this, but since I'm on lockdown at home because of the pandemic, I thought I'd try something new. As the title of the video says, I'm planning on this being the first in a series of videos teaching economics, so hopefully this goes well. Usually, economics involves a good deal of math, but don't worry, we aren't going to do math. Instead, we're going to concentrate on learning economic concepts and how they apply to real life. Mostly, we'll take a macroeconomic examination, meaning we'll look at the economy as a whole. But we may also touch on some microeconomic elements by looking at individuals or individual businesses. Part one of this series is called The Problem of Scarcity. In this video, we're going to identify what scarcity is and then analyze some related issues. Even though the word capitalism is in the title of this series, we aren't going to focus on capitalism just yet because there are some important and fundamental economic principles to understand before diving into an exploration of U.S. capitalism. Let's get to it. To start, let's go over a basic definition of economics. A typical textbook definition of economics would say something like, economics is the study of how people seek to satisfy their needs and wants by making choices. The need to make choices is an important feature in economics, and the need to make choices is because of something called the problem of scarcity. Scarcity refers to the fact that there is a limited amount of resources to meet unlimited needs and wants. A need is something that's necessary for survival, like food, shelter, clothing, and medicine, and a want is something that we desire but is not essential for survival. So examples of wants would include things like television, teddy bears, concert tickets, and even video games. Scarcity is a problem for things that are either needs or wants, or even both. I'll give you a couple examples. There aren't enough diamonds for everyone to have one. There's a limited supply of oil, and even though oil companies keep drilling for more, eventually all of the oil supplies will be used up. Uh, there are many trees on the earth currently, um, but it is certainly possible for someone to chop down all of the trees and pave over. So every resource that we could name is scarce, is limited. So as we use the earth's resources to provide goods and services for ourselves and others, we're faced with this problem of scarcity because all of our resources are limited. I just used the terms good and service. So let me pause for a moment and explain what those terms mean. A good is something physical or tangible, such as clothing, a smart TV, medicine, or a teddy bear. A service is an action or activity performed. So an example of services would include things like getting treated by a doctor, going to a concert to listen to musicians play, uh, or even getting a haircut. So whether we're talking about goods or services, or even needs or wants, the main point I'm trying to make is that scarcity is the fundamental problem economics is trying to deal with, and scarcity is a permanent problem, a permanent fact that all of the Earth's resources are limited. Scarcity is not the main problem I've heard the media talk about these days with the coronavirus pandemic, however. The media instead has been focusing on another economic concept, that is, the concept of shortage. A shortage is a temporary situation in which a good or a service is temporarily unavailable. So for example, the coronavirus pandemic has caused numerous shortages. There aren't enough face masks, there aren't enough ventilators, um, and some areas of the country don't even have enough space in hospitals, so not enough hospital beds for everybody. So we would say that there's a shortage of face masks, a shortage of ventilators, and a shortage of hospital beds. This is a situation that has arisen because there have been so many people getting infected very quickly, where a month ago there were plenty of those supplies, and now there are not. Now there are shortages of those supplies. If you've gone to the supermarket, you've probably seen shortages in other areas as well. For example, certain food products are suffering from shortages. When I went to the store the other day, there were no more cans of soup, and the bread was in very short supply, and the toilet paper was all gone from the shelves. 
So these are examples of there being shortages. The important thing to remember about a shortage is that it's a temporary situation. To deal with the current shortage of ventilators, President Trump has decided to use the Defense Production Act to force General Motors to produce more ventilators. This sort of government intervention to force companies to make more goods is uncommon in our capitalist system, but the coronavirus has presented unique and huge problems. In a capitalist economy, it's much more common for businesses to deal with shortages by raising prices and increasing supply. But we'll focus on that in another video. At this time, our government leaders have chosen to deal with the shortages by encouraging and even forcing companies to produce more and by trying to slow the rate of infections, which has been described as flattening the curve. Social distancing and stay-at-home orders are also part of this strategy. Slowing the spread of the coronavirus will hopefully give hospitals time to solve their shortage problems. The shortages of food and household supplies, like toilet paper, are caused by people panicking and hoarding. This has also created problems as greedy people have a lot and others have none or very little. This is getting a little awkward, so let's move on and get back to the concept of scarcity. I said earlier that scarcity is the permanent reality that the Earth's resources are limited, but people have unlimited needs and wants. Scarcity, therefore, requires us to make choices and trade-offs. When talking about making trade-offs, opportunity cost is a very important concept. Opportunity cost refers to the most desirable alternative given up when a decision is made. Sometimes opportunity cost is described as your next best option. Opportunity cost is a useful concept because it's a way to determine the value of something when a choice is made. And value can vary from person to person. Essentially, opportunity cost tells us that choosing one thing means giving up the opportunity to have or do the other. Let me give an example. If you choose to spend $15 buying a new book instead of buying a new t-shirt, the t-shirt is the opportunity cost of buying the book. Thinking of choices this way is useful because it helps us think about the decisions we make beyond just saying dollars and cents. Both the book and t-shirt cost $15. But another way to look at it is to say that you are giving up the opportunity to buy a new t-shirt because you bought the book. In other words, the t-shirt is the opportunity cost of buying the book. When making decisions about trade-offs like this, oftentimes we do something called thinking at the margin. This means you are thinking about whether doing or getting one more unit is worth it. I'm sure you do this sort of thinking all the time. For example, let's say you have two hours before you go to bed. You could spend one hour studying for a test and one hour watching TV. Spending one hour studying might get you a 70% on the test, so you think that studying for an additional hour could help you get a 90% or even better. As you are deciding between studying for two hours or not, and you're deciding whether you want to get the 90% grade or not, you are thinking at the margin. Let's assume you make the smart choice and decide to study for the additional hour. So then watching TV is the opportunity cost of that decision. In other words, by studying for the second hour, you gave up the opportunity to watch TV. Regardless of which decision you made, it's the act of thinking about whether that one additional hour of studying is worth it that's referred to as thinking at the margin. So there you have it. I've gone over some of the basic foundational concepts and terms in economics. These aren't specific only to capitalism, but economics as a whole. In the next part of this video series, we'll explore how societies deal with the problem of scarcity by establishing economic systems. See you next time.